Yes, yes. Welcome to the ancient world of tabletop games. I am Agamemnon from the historical documentary Time Bandits. This is a report from a fugitive. Almost all of the board games on my shelves are in boxes. There are a few aberrations in tins. I'm looking at you, Forbidden Desert. If you want to keep stuff in a tin in Scotland, it better be shortbread. And we keep that shortbread in a special kind of tin called a packet. Just say no to tins, folks. Tinned board games and no can opener. What were they thinking? On my shelves, almost all of the board games in boxes are in good condition. A few came to me scuffed or grazed through international travel, and that's inevitable. I would only return the box if an elephant clearly sat on it in the factory. One game was discounted through box damage. Here it is, Chang Chang. It was worth buying at the reduced price. The box featured the usual corner split damage. If a game goes through normal wear, it goes there first. That was all. No other calamity. Game components were fine on the inside. I resolved to cure the box. How do you fix a problem like that without burning down the house? Yes, you can use tape on the insides of boxes, but you'll go to board gaming hell for that. Better to use glue. Clamp the loose box edges together and seal the seam. Give the weld time to take hold. Test it to make sure the box still fits. Job done. Sounds easy. As usual, it's a fiddly prospect. How do you really do that, though? Not just how do you fix the damned thing. I mean, how will I fix the damned thing on camera to show you how it is done? Even fiddlier than fixing it. I'll have a go. Yes, I do all my own publicity stunts. First things first. I vowed not to glue anything live on camera. Too much scope for disaster. Fixing plastic figures with warm water was almost a step too far, and I'm not risking the equipment like that again. No, I can't trust myself. I will glue the camera to a boxed war game. The problem is that I don't have many boxes to fix. I've inherited role-playing game boxes that were full to bursting, and those travelled around a lot, some of them supposedly fixed with tape on the outside. It's an imperfect universe. Ah well. For purposes of this demonstration, I'll concentrate on something new. It's something old. Here's a Dungeons & Dragons game, Conquest of Nerath. It's from 2011, and in board game years, that makes it positively ancient in the high-tech jetpack future of 2019. The board game carries an age recommendation of 12+, plus, and that pops up again in 2014 with the release of the D&D starter set. Okay, 11-year-olds can play D&D too, the world won't end, unless the adventure you play is about the end of the world. Why is this game new if it is old? It's the category that's fresh. Something new on my shelves. A second-hand board game, at long last. I've avoided the second-hand board game market until now. Chang Chang was from a shop and offered up slightly damaged. Conquest of Nerath is out of print and only available for the second-hand market. My research into cost showed I paid about the same today as I'd have paid if I'd bought the game on release, and I consider that a bargain at 40-odd pounds plus postage for a game with a battered box. The game itself was sold unplayed, with the cardboard tokens left inside the punchboard frames. Someone bought the game, opened the bag of dice, looked it over, and then, for whatever reason, the game was shunted around from here to there and suffered box damage. Most copies of the game on sale now are available used. The game's been played and punched out with the box insert filled to bursting by the time it goes on sale. There are unplayed games out there, like this one, and very few examples of sealed games on the market. You pay close to double what I paid for a truly unused copy trapped like amber in its factory fresh cellophane shroud. Let's talk about that for a moment. I'm not a collector. You can wade a short distance out into the interwebs before you stumble on videos of Americans touring fully kitted basements of supermarket-style shelves packed with gaming loot from farm fresh to the dusty days of yesteryear. Those people are collectors. They have sealed games, dead and shrink-wrap, and never played and never to be played. 
occasionally in multiple identical copies just sitting fossilised on those shelves. I try to look after the games on my shelves, but I recognise and fully accept that wear is a thing and tear is Ware's bestest pal. When it comes to metal figures, for example, my entire painting system was always based on the notion that those were working figures. They'd be chipped and worn and sprayed with cola and smeared in foodstuffs of questionable nutritional value, as gamers would look after them. Mostly we succeeded in preserving the tools and gadgets and bits and pieces of the games we played, but they were never display case objects. I keep a few large figures in a cabinet, and those form the exception, Working games and figures are there for use. Look after them, but don't turn to golem levels of preciousness unless you want to have an unplayed collection. That's your business if you do, it's not for me. I've seen people drop figures in the most awkward ways that killed off any notion of simple repair. The pliers, files and glue bottles come out anyway. I watched the heaviest gamer in the room sit on the most fragile plastic models at a gaming club. Luckily they weren't mine and that's as much as I can say of the disaster. Game Master's screens bore the brunt of hilarious RPG moments that coincided with a drink. You can't help but spray everywhere. Screens aren't there to hide your dice, they are for everyone's safety while players' antics make the whole room laugh. No, I'm not a collector. It's true that I have multiple identical copies of games, but any extra copies are for channel giveaways or for channel collaborators. I decided, before a single video was made, that international collaborators who needed copies of the games would have those copies at my expense. They wouldn't be out of pocket just to turn up and play a game online. Let's go back to D&D. &D. The game sat here untouched while I filmed my series on RPG starter sets and beginner boxes. Now I'm done with that series, I'll repair the box lid and punch out the tokens. Why buy an out-of-print game? The price was reasonable for what was on offer. I wanted to try a dudes on a map game and this had a D&D &D theme. If I make a video on what is a dudes on a map game, I'll use this as one example. A game needn't be readily available when I come up with a video topic. I try to film board games you could go out and buy somewhere at relatively cheap rates. That isn't always the case. An explanatory video serves as a jumping off point into other games of that type. Newer games, easily bought, with interesting developments in board gaming since the days of the featured games release. As time unfolds across the centuries, the freshest games are destined to fall out of print. At that point, the channel serves as an archive of what once was. I'd prefer to see board games trapped in amber that way, in ancient video archives, rather than in cellophane on shelves. No cellophane here. If collecting for the sake of collecting is your thing, that's your thing. I find those Aladdin's caves of games puzzling, and while interesting, they just aren't for me. Let's assemble the tools. First the one tool you can't see, good ventilation. No matter the type or amount of glue you use or the duration of the process, stay ventilated. This flat surface is great for absorbing studio lighting, but it's no damn good for glue operations. I use plastic sheeting when painting figures. It has the advantage of being its own paint mixing tray, as you can see. We'll use that veteran of the paint wars for the glue procedure. You'll need paper glue. This isn't the type of job for super glue or epoxy resin. Opinion is divided over the use of wood glue. You definitely need wood glue for this, unless you definitely don't, and must avoid wood glue like the plague. I'm sticking with basic paper craft glue. That's what I used before and the repair worked. Craft glue and wood glue are treated with suspicion given the level of water content in them. Adding water to your cardboard box will make it turn evil after midnight. Use glue sparingly. Did I mention ventilation? Stay ventilated no matter what you're doing with glue, even minor repairs. It gets you into the habit of staying ventilated during larger jobs, when you fill a table with a production line of glued plastic figures that you're about to paint as though the world's ending in a headlong gaming rush. No one's getting high on this stuff. Why not? You're staying ventilated. If this is too fiddly, get an adult to help you. That's what I always do. Identify the problem. Worn out or fractured corners on the box lid. The main box is unaffected and we'll be leaving that as is. Here someone's added tape to the inside of the lid. Hard to see why. There's no fracture, tear or rip there. If you pick up a box second hand and someone's had a go at repair with tape, ask yourself if they did a good job. They didn't. Don't use tape. 
If it's easier to leave a repair in place, please do. Removing this tape would do nothing for the box lid. Best to leave it where it lurks. Tape fades and cracks, scarred by the sands of time. It's far easier to remove that brittle mess further down the line. I can't recommend tape for box repair. Just put the roll down and walk slowly away from it. Assemble a few very basic tools. Use what's to hand. First have a bottle of paper glue handy. This brand was sold alongside these glue scrapers, so I'll have the scraper ready for removing or spreading and tidying excess glue. Glue gets everywhere. It's little known that when they left the relative safety of the Swiss cuckoo clock industry for the uncertainty of America's shores, the Gygax family started off as the Glugax family. And that is a Dungeons and Dragons fact. Before opening a bottle of glue, create a pile of material for wiping up glue. If you can't find Wayward Hobbit's paper will do, keep your fingers clean. Yes, I question the wisdom of making these videos in gloves. I wear them for comedy effect, for thematic ties to the topic under discussion, and for continuity purposes. Magic appearance and disappearance of paper cuts in videos is distracting. Wearing gloves and pouring glue in front of a camera lens takes us to the camera supplier. You'll need clamps. These are improvised, sawn off a coat hanger. How much do you care about your box? Your level of commitment dictates the strength of the clamps involved. Moderate clamping is fine. Industrial strength clamps wreck the cardboard for eternity, but I don't care about that. I'm not a collector. Try to avoid clamps with large wire clips on them. You want to bypass all that ironmongery to reach the scene of the cardboard crime when applying the glue. The bracing material is also important. I'm using L-shaped brackets that I found lying around in a box. They aren't ideal, but they did the job on the Great Wall of China, and that's saying something. I prefer these as they are small and light. No need to build an Eiffel Tower out of heavy material just to fix a box. Consider cutting tools. Scissors, knives, scalpels, a guillotine, those whirring blades and the robot Maximilian in the black hole. The equipment on call must match the job at hand. You won't need those cutting tools, but have them handy anyway. You might want to create bracing supports from thin card, the kind you'll glue in place for very weak boxes. Break complicated box repairs into easy to manage chunks. If the box is too far gone, construct an identical box and print a new cover to go on it. That's out of our scope. Alternatively, dump your game in plastic storage. I place loads of game components in plastic storage anyway, so that's not a problem for me. One gamer's heresy is another gamer's doctrine. With a three-way split at the box corner, make your own judgments. I'd recommend tackling multiple splits on a corner, one at a time, leaving an overnight drying session for every ruptured seam involved. Glue the longest one in place first. The less flappy the cardboard is, the less fiddly the later repairs are. If you are lucky, a single split may occur at a box flap, and that's the easiest thing to glue back together. All of this is done using a seam of glue and bracing with clamps. No tape. There's another option, and that's gluing thin card inside the split corner to provide added stability. You must use the thinnest card in the smallest quantities if this is inner box lid repair to allow for the box lid to fit over the box with that extra bracing applied. A subdivision within that cardboard option is only open to you if there's a gap between the outer paper cover and the inner cardboard box. It is then possible to sandwich your thin bracing cardboard between those surfaces on one box side and to fit the other end into the connecting box side, hiding the L-shaped cardboard brace from view. That can be glued inside the gaps using a special technique known as the fiddly as fuck process, as well as gluing the seam in the normal manner. Each repair is different based on box damage. Did I mention ventilation? Keep the air flowing and keep your cats out of the room. This is another item that's beyond my video's scope. You'll have your own tried and trusted methods. I employ the device of not having cats. Works for me. I recommend securing the braces with clamps first before you glue anything. Test fit the clamps, then leave them in at the best points for bracing. I'd say place them just right to hold the whole package together, not too close to the box corner. Avoid obstructing the gluing process. So clamp first, glue next. If you want to glue first and then clamp, knock yourselves out. Protect what you must. If you want to save the box art from the worst excesses of clamping, put a layer of flat plastic in there under the clamp jaws. Just be aware of stray waves of glue if you go down that route. Avoid contaminating any temporary scaffolding you mean to take back out. You are only gluing the box. 
clamp the box in place with enough wiggle room for the glue to reach both of the repair surfaces. You could faff about with brushes to paint the edges with glue, but I think that's more trouble than it's worth. Then, with the edges glued, tighten the seam and just glue away from the box corner out to the edge. Use glue sparingly. If there isn't enough in place, do another run. You want to avoid too much goo, gunk and gunge. As solicitors, they are disreputable. This scraper helps shove glue into the places it needs to go and wipes excess from places glue gathered. Avoid any lump or pool of glue remaining. First, it takes longer to dry, and second, you run the risk of creating a glue bump that obstructs the smooth fitting of the box lid. Glue away, scrape the excess off, refit the clamps if they've shifted slightly during all this. Leave the box to dry overnight, prop it up over the workspace so that it doesn't accidentally glue itself to your table from seepage. Not that you'll have a seepage problem, just prepare for one. Have patience. Let the glue dry. If you want to go daft with a hair dryer, that's your business. Best to let it all dry overnight. Next day, inspect the results. What looks like excess glue when wet will dry to a reasonable level by the next morning. If you have to go back in and glue a second seam, even a third one, just repeat the process day by day rather than complicating the initial operation. How successful was the repair to the Great Wall of China? I made a house call with the game. Chang Cheng travelled upright, stowed safely aboard the in-flight luggage backpack. These plastic great walls are weighty in unison, and the force of the whole game bore down on the repaired seam. Not to go all Tolkien on you, but the repair survived there and back again. The inner box is dented, but there's little to be done about that. Over in D&D land, there is little to do about worn surfaces. This had a price tag on it, and someone's had a go at removing that. I'm not here to make matters worse. Stay ventilated, no distractions, go in with braces and clamps, adjust to fit your gluing style, apply the glue in a line, work excess glue out of there with a scraper of some kind. If you don't have a plastic one, use shiny card to ditch the extra glue. Brushes are fiddly. Glue scrapers are too, but they are easier to clean. Lay down that seam of glue, prop your box where it won't fall over or drip on small creatures and await the rather boring results. Next day, dried and done. A few glue bubbles were in there, but they didn't impede the closing of the lid. Fix the seams first and go after loose aircraft-sized wings of box art paper after all the screaming and shouting is done. Use glue ultra-sparingly for the paper sections. Did I mention ventilation? How good do your repairs need to be? If you keep the game on a shelf and move it on and off, shelf to table, table to shelf, simple repairs like this will do you fine. But if the game is a large game that sees a lot of travel, and it's a much older game, then you're better off transferring the whole game to plastic box storage. Why say that? Here we veer off into the board gaming world's military zone, province of the war gamers. We're talking about battered boxes strafed by swooping sop with camels, cardboard edges renamed Shell Hole Corner and Ambush Alley. Very old war games with intact boxes are real, they exist. According to the Geneva Convention, old wargame boxes must be protected. They are of thinner construction, sometimes only of partial box construction being put together in strange ways, bordering on magic. Enter the first rule of von Clausewitz. Plastic storage is the continuation of box storage with the intermixing of other means. If you don't feel up to box repair, move everything to plastic boxes. Preserve what you can. Don't be precious about preservation, and don't worry if your attempted repair leaves a gluey mess. You've just personalised your game, that's all.